question, I mean, I think uh, Dr. Pai is not there, but just like to have a, just have a, how will you differentiate between, maybe Dr. Kiran can go first, how will you differentiate between a follicular conjunctivitis caused by the medication and the conjunctivitis which is epidemically occurring now, <laughs> if a patient is on such medication. For the, for the perspective of the general, you know, uh, ophthalmologist who are here. From a clinical perspective here. or uh, from a clinical? Clinical perspective, perspective. and… So, your, your patient is already on? On, yeah. Primonidine, uh, which is the notorious drug for follicular conjunctivitis for some time and now the patient has developed uh, some degree of conjunctivitis. Okay. Closer, closer to the mood. Okay. Uh, closer. I, I suppose… Uh, you know, whenever a patient is on brimonidine and they come with certain signs of these, you know, uh, these symptoms, generally, yeah, we think about, my usual principle is that I generally treat them, you know, with generally with a combination of some antibiotic and steroid. If it is recurring again and again, that is an indication that the drug is causing it. But generally, a lot of these atopic dermatitis findings are in the surrounding areas. The skin involvement and, yeah, will skin be more. involvement. That okay. is generally more typical. And if you see those eyes, you tend to get a feeling, okay, this is brimonidine. I remember you showed this uh, picture today. Yeah, you showed in the… Uh, in, the in the lecture. Yeah. So, while the picture was being shown, I was t t telling… The moment I saw that picture, that that's a brimonidine eye. <laughs> yeah. that, that's… The skin… Yeah, skin really excoriation, you have contact dermatitis. dermatitis. So, that Dr. is Meena. an idea. In fact, uh, last week only we had uh, one case. So, what I found is this, uh, yes, uh, of course, if it's a viral, uh, there won't be much of discharge, but these patients come with this uh, little bit of discharge, which is not very common with brimonidine uh, allergy and that sticky sensation. Yeah, morning stickiness is uh, It sometimes is can give you a clue and definitely as uh, Dr. Kiran said, sometimes we have to take a chance like stop probably the stop the medicine and, and then see. Uh, see. Many a time patients themselves stop and come. So that itself give us a clue that yes, it is because of this you or know, not. The problem with the brimonidine is I think the picture you showed today was after two weeks. Like after two weeks yeah, of therapy. immediately. That was very all of a sudden. So yeah, yeah. that happened. So that very actually puts you, uh, at least gives you some clue. Yeah. clue. But a lot of these brimonidine delayed hypersensitivity can occur months correct, later. Correct, so yeah. that is when uh, you have to be very… Sir, you have any… I think most of these patients, uh, if you take the history, they will tell you that a regular uh, allergy is there. And that patient, you add uh, brimonidine, it comes, then you know that uh, it's a patient is already having. But uh, still, you have to remember that the combination can come. So that is again possible. Some, sometimes you will be misled at that. You, the patient will tell, I am having this allergy for a long time. Then you label it as a regular uh, allergic uh, problem. But uh, maybe an added one when you use brimonidine. Actually, uh, personally speaking, I am. Uh, if you, are, if you ask me which is the drug which is most uh, uh, threatening for my clinical practice, I will tell Brimonidine. Yeah, yeah. Brimonidine allergies, yes. I because think I, I have an… Actually, when the Brimonidine was introduced, one doctor has prescribed a Brimonidine and that patient, an young patient, went into shock. And that was uh, a lot of cases and I was asked to uh, give an expert opinion, had a lot of problem in that thing. But that Actually, it's one drop patient went into shock. Yeah. That must be an idiosyncratic Ooh. reaction. We cannot predict know. that. One patient. And uh, after that, uh, every patient, I used to check uh, BP for every patient. And uh, for my surprise, I have seen a lot of patients reduction in the BP, absolutely not 50 or 60 or more aged. Younger patient. So, this is one another thing in, uh, that's what in pregnancy also, the last week one person, one lady was sitting in front of me, she was, she returned from US, she was asking which medicine she has to continue. And uh, she studied everything in the uh, Google and uh, came. So, you tell about uh, one medicine, she will tell that this, 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 this is a side effects and problem. SLT, SLT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what to do? That is a question. Yeah, so, what I've noticed is for this brimonidine, uh, you would notice this when you're doing surgery. You'll have follicles all over the bulbar conjunctiva, you know. So, I've noticed that if the bulbar conjunctiva is involved, then it is more like brimonidine allergy. 
if there is fornicial con conjunctiva is involved, then I understand there is more conjunctivitis. So that is one way of uh, sort of early diagnosis we can come to. Coming to this pregnancy, uh, again this is a very uh, yeah, difficult topic. Because uh, I think the probably the safest drug might be timolol. To be very honest, that might be safer, drug, but it's still a category C drug yeah. uh, for all practical purposes. But uh, so, what does category C say? What does it mean? I think uh, I mean I, uh, exactly. I don't remember exactly yeah. what it means. But I think the reason is uh, it's it can cross the barrier uh, and uh, create some sort of organogenesis issues or something like that, and can cause respiratory depression with timolol. You know respiratory depression and the bronchospasm or something like that. That's, I think. Brumonidine is the uh, safest in safest, the... Yeah. Uh, so, it's category B. Uh, it's category uh, B. B. Pregnancy. Yeah, pregnancy. So, but, uh, <laughs> this is the problem. You see, you give timolol to... I mean, we are taking, uh, talking about timolol, giving timolol to old patients. Yeah? <coughs> I mean, unless they have a known bronchospasm or COPD history, none of them do really have any complaints. Yeah. Theoretically, timolol has also been shown to have effects on CNS activity, depression, etc. But brimonidine produces so much of drowsiness in certain group of people and uh, the, I mean, this is not based on any data. I am saying from your clinical practice, the people uh, with the greatest complaints, uh, complaints seem to be uh, <laughs> the ones with brimonidine, you know, with uh, depression and uh, especially this extra sleepiness. Some people say dry mouth, uh, yeah, dry mouth and sometimes sleep is completely disturbed. They are not able to sleep on, you know, on these kind of systemic effects and I wonder if these are the kind of systemic effects we have then how is it very safe in pregnancy yeah. when it uh, sir you wanted to ask something sir talking about combination the prostaglandin analogs uh, when it's combined with timolol found that the congestion is less otherwise if it, is it did you mention that I don't I don't know if I heard it or not of Fixed combination is that one can uh, help in the other. So when we add timolol, definitely the hyperemia is less in uh, combinations. Yeah, right. uh, then I agree with uh, Dr. Radharaman and this brimonidine, one patient I prescribed, she said, I put one drop and I felt tremendous pal palpitation, then I stopped. <laughs> Then I stopped. So I'm also very careful about uh, picking uh, this thing. And one question I wanted to ask, this drugs which increases UVO scleral outflow, can it, uh, it causes uh, inflammation as a side effect, right? Because of the inflammation, can it cause some trabeculitis and cause a paradoxical increase in pressure? Um, I think, sir, if you uh, looked at the uh, development of prostaglandins, uh, when they started, you know, of course, 1996 Latropros came out and a few years before they st uh, we were developing these drugs, they actually started with higher concentrations. Whenever they do trials, you know, they will look at multiple concentrations. And they actually found that with higher concentrations, they, there was a paradoxical increase in uh, intraocular pressure with the higher concentrations. So, uh, with these concentrations, I think the inflammatory effect is very minimal. And uh, with the concentrations of the prostaglandins we use, with higher concentrations, yes, that is what was found in the initial trial data. So theoretically, it is possible. Uh, but the concentrations we use have very little inflammation. And I think the, the, the MMP, the matrix metalloprotein is remodeling. Uh, and the uh, c corresponding increase in UV scleral outflow will counteract any inflammatory tendency that these drugs have. But so, higher? Uh, on a caveat, uh, we always have to think of uh, the proprietary medication versus generic. That's another aspect which we have not actually touched today. Uh, uniformly, none of us have spoken on it because the proprietary are from the original molecules which have come. The government of India, DGCI, approves generics and they give them 10% plus minus of that concentration and the quality and quantity also. Excipients, which are the BAK and the other uh, associated uh, molecules which are present, they can be 50% plus or minus. That is, that is written in the law. So based on that, we have to see what sort of product has been used and then what is giving a side effect. So 10% more in brimonidine will be enormous for that patient. Yeah, I think uh, there have been uh, publications from India also, pharmacokinetic studies on certain top brands comparing it to the patented ones then found a lot of difference in even the active molecular formulation, forget the excipients. But that is a, but that is a picture. 
we, we will be forced to prescribe a generic. I think that now some of the patients start telling, you give me the, this thing, because now we start giving the both, say the generic as well as the this, uh, proprietary things, because we put it bracket. So uh, the patient going to the, some medical shops and all this thing, they get it. And uh, it's so funny that uh, so one month he uses uh, <laughs> The generic another month uses, we are totally confused. And sometimes we will tell it is due to the compliance that the patient is using it. It's a very, very difficult to assess it. So, uh, we have to be very careful, make sure that what… Always ask the patient to bring back the molecule, the medicine as well as the prescription. Then only… and then always try to find out the end points for progression. Like for example, check the IOP, check the visual field, check the OCT, see if they are deteriorating on that and then only give an opinion. So, if we just continue CST, it may become a big <laughs> issue <laughs> because medical legally we are uh, liable for anything which we do. So, what we do for pregnancy is, uh, as you said, Timolol I found the safest. I let Timolol run. Pilocarpine also I found quite safe. So, if, I, if you read the old books by Lee Albert, uh, Wallace Lee Albert, he says that you can continue Timolol and Pilocarpine which actually works quite well provided the, provided the patient tolerates it two days before. Uh, parturition, two days after you stop it so that the fetal bradycardia will not occur and pilocarpine will also not have the effect of uh, increased salivation and aspiration risk and two days later you start the medication. So that's the standard which is, which we, I still prefer to follow that and after the first trimester I don't mind starting off in uh, dozolamide and brimonidine I can do. So you have four molecules to use uh, during pregnancy. Lactation you can switch back to prostaglandin. Any other question from the floor? No. So, thank you all the panelists, all present here. I think uh, I expected a very less and a crowd actually. It was so encouraging even the last section. Uh, few people remain here on a basic uh, subject. So, thank you all.